Um, I'm Jan Tobias, and I'm presenting this talk about between testing and formal verification. Um, and, and Philippe just pointed out that maybe, you know, if you're looking for that middle ground between testing or verification, like if you neither want to test nor formally verify, then maybe the best thing you could potentially do is kneel down and pray for um, help or correctness or whatever. Um, that's not what this talk is about. So what I want to investigate is actually that, that intersection where you can use uh, formal methods to um, improve your testing results or where you can use formal methods to generate specific test cases or where you can uh, investigate how well you have tested a certain piece of software to give you certain security guarantees. So that's what I'm trying to talk here about. But um, this talk went through several iterations during the last couple of days because initially there was another talk on testing and I thought, okay, that sounds quite nice. I can kind of build upon this. Um, then I think it dropped out and, and now, well, we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to make this quite interactive and here is a first question for you. You have a very exceptionally, extremely simple piece of C code there. Um, how much testing do we have to do there? When have we tested this piece of code enough? So, I mean, I don't know if there's a professional tester here amongst you, but maybe you can just give me some ideas how you would approach um, testing this one function. Hmm? Yeah. So you have a, I mean, you have multiple branches there. Yeah. Every statement, so you would have to cover every branch of the statement. Okay, that's one approach. Okay, branch coverage, basically, yeah. So um, we skipped the first one. So th th there are several. I just opened the Wikipedia page about a coverage criteria and picked the first one and just outline what you would do in each of them to, to um, test this specific function. And of course, the first one is to say you do function coverage. That means for your program, you invoke every function exactly once. Great, okay. The next thing would be to do statement coverage. That means... Um, you try to execute every single statement in that program that you want to test at least once. Um, if you want to do that, then this here would be a nice test case. So essentially you um, select true for A, B, and C, and you would execute every single statement, including the return, in one single test case. Um, then I think we are already at branch or decision coverage, and here you would have to have two test cases. That is, you would have to cover the true branch with the first test case and the false branch with the second test case where you set uh, C to false. Um, what else could you do? Yeah, you could do multiple combinations. So the next one would be, for example, condition coverage. That means um, you test each of the individual Boolean conditionals here to be true or false. Um, Importantly, you see that conditional co condition coverage does not imply uh, branch coverage. So in these two cases here, um, you basically only test the false branch, not the true branch. But you have, it, you, you have uh, alternated, you have, um, you have tested all conditionals in different um, true and false conditions. Now, the, one of the possible combination of this, combinations of this would be um, 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 modified condition decision coverage, which is something people who work in avionics or even in the automotive sector are pretty used to, which means you have to test all branches and you have to cover all possible um, um, conditions here. So you end up with four test cases. And of course you can see, you, you can build this up a bit. And if you look further, there's multiple condition coverage. For example, you can do something like parameter value coverage, which in this case would be equivalent to MCDC. Um, there are lots of ways to investigate this one particular piece of code till you satisfy one of your criteria of your choice and you know, okay, I've satisfied it probably, I've done enough to um, deliver this piece of code to the person who, all, who asked me to produce it. Fair enough. Now, um, it's very simplistic. There are only like three bool conditions here and well, how do we talk about this? What good is it to talk about this? Let's look at something more realistic. This piece of code. Um, it has, as you can see, one big disadvantage. That is, there are no conditionals. So when have you tested this piece of software enough? And probably you can already infer from this one constant in there that this, whoops, I'm pressing something I shouldn't press. Um, from, from this one constant in here that this involves an SSL functionality that has been found out to be buggy in one way or another. So, questions for you. Which criterion would be the best to test this? Um, 
how do we test code in general that does not contain conditions, that does not branch at all? How do we test code that depends a lot on, um, let's say, I.O. inputs or even I.O. inputs that are really hard to generate in the lab, that are really hard to write test cases for? Think of, I have two examples here, like the, the Dutch Delta Works or the SDI program, where your inputs depend on really catastrophic conditions on the outside that are measured by sensors somewhere in your system, how would you ever generate all the potential test cases that you would need to actually ensure that this highly safety critical system reacts appropriately in all possible conditions you may meet in reality? Um, how do you know that you've never missed test cases that result in uh, like fatal failures where people actually die if your plane crashes or your, your delta works, your, your floodgates, your storm surges don't close in the right, at the right moment, in the right time, don't make the right decision? Um, how do you deal with concurrency? So, I mean, often you have like systems that involve multiple threads that operate on, let's say, one core or even on a distributed scenario. How do you make sure that there are no weird conditions that result in races between different threats that can be either even abused by an attacker or that can result in failure of a system, crashes or whatever. Um, and, and, well, even if you think of having a way of finding all these funny interactions that you would have to consider, who would ever write all these test cases? And how do you motivate that person to um, write proper test cases for this version of the software, for the next version of the software, where you change like two lines of code that might have some implications that are unclear, things like that. And last one, security properties. What are the security properties of this specific piece of software? How can you encode these security properties in sensible test cases or in assertions in the code? You see, there are a lot of questions coming up when you think of um, testing this little bit here. Um, by the way, um, this is the SSL heartbleed thing. Who knows where the error is, roughly? Yay, where is it? It's a uh, Okay, there are no line numbers. The, the bug is exactly here. It has something to do with this mem copy. I'll explain on the next couple of slides how this all interacts and how it fits together. So, um, now, when you, when you look a bit around about um, how you get your software to be, like, provable, correct, you'll find interesting articles. Some of them may promise you too much, some of them promise you exactly what you're looking for. You find like, um, this, this is all recent stuff that I picked up from the last like uh, maybe three years or two years by just searching Google News um, for, for information on how to make code really secure and proof against failure and things like that. So you'll find papers or, or articles in popular magazines that talk about formal methods, about um, how people at university research groups have identified severe bugs in, let's say, the Java runtime environment and fixed them using formal methods. Um, you find very interesting articles, for example, this one where people have used a model checker. I'll explain a bit later what that is. A tool that aims to exhaustively enumerate um, the state space of, let's say, a piece of software or something like that, and found severe bugs with this. In this, in this case, this was a bug um, in a floating point unit of an aircraft that resulted in stops of that aircraft, so they couldn't continue the, the starting process or something like that, but had to abort and do something about it. Um, that wasn't found by testing, that was only found when the aircraft was actually running, and there is software out there that helps you to identify these, um, these flaws, these faults, long before you actually deploy your code. Or maybe this one, Amazon is apparently using something that is called formal methods to get their systems correct. Um, others as well. But you know, if you think about it, these techniques are apparently out there for a couple of years, but Heartbleed was also out there for a couple of years. So why has no one, you know, applied these techniques to a piece of software like the SSL library that is obviously security critical in many domains? So, many, many questions. Let's try to define a bit what the different things are we are talking about. So, I just collected a couple of bullet points that came up while preparing for this talk. Um, one side you have testing, the other side is about formal methods. And I think the key difference here is that when you talk about formal methods, then you're trying to 
um, employ methods that try to mathematical, mathematically argue or use mathematical methods to argue for the correctness of a specific piece of software or for the absence of errors in this specific piece of software. While testing, on the other hand, is typically uh, empirical, evidence-based. Um, so on this side, you use mathematical model methods or methods that allow you to prove that some tool that you're applying to the software is somehow exhaustive, explores the entire state space, or at least gives you a notion of knowing what you have covered exactly, not just in terms of this branch and that branch, but in terms of behavior, in terms of input space for the program. Things that are very hard to measure if you just, even if you do fuzzing and, and select random inputs for your program and try to um, investigate the behavior that way. It's often very hard to say exactly what you have tested, what you have done, and what is outside of the scope of your testing effort. And that's the, the kind of thing we're trying to do here on this side. And, well, this talk is actually in the, in the software lifecycle uh, domain I've heard earlier. So here you have a software lifecycle, and, well, I'm, I'm not an advocate of iterative or agile or whatever, but what you typically do in most development projects is something like this. You may base it on the V model, you may base it on the waterfall model, but in the end you still have phases and you repeat these phases somehow and you have transitions between those phases and one of these phases is testing. So there will be a phase where you generate some artifact, be it code, be it um, a specification document, something like that, and after you've done, after you've generated these artifacts, you may test them in one way or another. And how you do that testing depends largely on your domain, depends largely on your um, security and safety requirements, depends on what the customer actually wants you to do, how secure this thing has to be, and how much he's willing to pay, of course. So when we talk about formal methods, then there is, of course, a whole bunch of formal methods that, that you can apply to the very same artifacts that you would test. But there's also a lot of stuff that you would look at maybe at the requirements phase or at the design phase. So, for example, um, if you think of the, 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 the flood search barriers in, in Holland, they would do a lot of stuff here at this level and try to formally define exactly how the system is supposed to behave. And then there are other methods that um, can take these formal specifications and generate designs from them or prove that a certain design that you came up with is kind of equivalent or refines your specification. So if you want to see it like that, you could come up with a whole life cycle around that that is based on uh, formal interactions, on formal methods, on specifications, and on um, proving that what you have specified at this level is somewhat related to what you have developed here and what you have implemented here. And you can even um, use methods that actually apply that to the code or to the, to the final artifacts that you produce. Um, today, I want to kind of skip this whole area here. I have some references for you at the end. You can look at it and, and maybe there's something really exciting for you in there. But I want to focus a bit on uh, methods here at the bottom, methods that you can use like after you have created a software to find errors, um, to prove that certain errors are not in the piece of software that you're going to deploy, things like that. So that's the rough scope here. Any questions so far? No. Um, there, there is one important quotation that I would like to start with here. Um, I do believe that testing can, in some cases, to some limited extent, maybe replace, I uh, know that, that formal methods can, to some limited extent, replace testing, um, but never completely. So you, you should never trust a system that has just been verified by some specific method, however nice that method looks to be. In the end, it's important that you still do your integration testing and that you run your code and that you see that it actually behaves in the right way and interacts with, I don't know, sensors, actuators, the user in the way you intend it to be. So a formal proof is typically no guarantee for um, correct behavior in, in all practical conditions that you might deploy your, so uh, deploy your software in. That's the takeaway here I want to start with. Um, and then let's look at one piece of verification software that is, de uh, that is developed at our group, iMac Distrinet, that is very fast. Hmm? 
Um, I think very fast has been presented in the context of SecUp Dev before, maybe, I don't know, one, two years ago. I'm not, I'm not really sure about that. Um, it's a tool that can take a given piece of software. Here again is our um, heartbeat bug. And you provide additional information in terms of annotations that say, for example, what the post conditions of a function are, what the preconditions of that function are, how that function is supposed to interact with the operating system, with the surrounding environment. Um, and it allows you to then reason about that piece of software and identify places where pre and post conditions don't hold, where you have like memory error violations and things like that. I'll explain in a bit, a bit more about what all these little things here are and why they are important and how they relate to your program. The interesting thing is if you just stick um, the heartbeat function in and you provide appropriate um, annotations for all these methods that are invoked here, like this S2N function, whatever it means, like the mem copy function, whatever it means, it will find this error. Hey, fantastic, it gives you a red bar up here, and that red bar says exactly what I've printed here at the bottom again. It's hard to interpret, no question about that, but it tells you, okay, there is something wrong here. And if you know that tool very well and you're able to dissect this thing here, then essentially it tells you that um, if one of these buffers here has a specific size and the other buffer has a specific size and some certain conditions hold for this third argument, the payload argument, then you have a buffer overflow or better, or to, to say it in different words, a buffer override in that case. And that's exactly the error that takes place here. So um, what happens is that we write more bytes from this buffer to this buffer than there actually are in this buffer. That's the whole thing about heartbleed because this payload number here, this, this payload variable is a number that is just bigger than the size of one of these two buffers. That's the whole problem. Um, so what very fast does is it applies a technique that is called symbolic execution which I'm trying to explain on, on these slides here. Um, symbolic execution is very different from a concrete execution in the sense that in a concrete execution, you rely on um, executing your program with one specific set of inputs, um, concrete inputs rather than symbolic inputs. In a symbolic execution, you use symbolic inputs. That means these three parameters of the function foo can take any value that is somewhere in the range of um, the type bool. So um, how do we implement that? Well, there are tools around there, let's say constraint solvers, let's say SMT solvers, SAT solvers, stuff like that, that allow you to um, basically express this program as a constraint system and then see, then ask the solver, ask the tool that you're using to find a solution for, let's say, this formula here. Is there a possible input that could satisfy this specific formula? If so, then this branch is certainly reachable. If not, then this branch is reachable. And well, once we have these two inputs, we can of course use them in test cases. Or we can see if there are like other interesting interactions to satisfy um, potential branches that are somewhere in here. So what do we do? Um, one of these tools is V3 by Microsoft, probably one of the more famous um, SMT solvers to do this kind of job. You can just declare those three variables as um, Boolean inputs. You, gen you then basically formalize the condition of this if statement as an assertion. So here, this is just uh, prefix notation. We have the or, A and B, and the and C. Oh, I'm always pressing something else. And the, end, and the um, disjunction of the, of the other part here. And then we just ask the solver, hey solver, is this solvable? Is there a solution? Is it satisfiable? And if there is a solution, we can ask it to give us a model to um, refine this satisfiable argument into a concrete set of values that we have to assign to A, B, and C to enter this branch. And it's pretty clear here we get for A true and for C also true. Actually, B doesn't matter in that case, right? B could be either true or false. We are still entering this branch. So this is another interesting aspect here. It also means that these tools kind of um, implicitly give us like minimalistic test cases. There is no simpler condition to satisfy this if statement. And if we then ask for um, 
a model that satisfies the false branch, that means go to the return immediately, we probably also get to, in, to a very minimalistic um, test case that we can use later on in testing or in further exploring program behavior. Another nice thing is we can say, for example, that we want to keep this for later exploration, for example, because we want to explore another branch and just push it to some stack of these constraints. Um, once we are done with getting the model here, we just pop it get, we just pop it back, meaning that we forget about this assertion and put a new assertion. That means not whatever we have here in the in the constraint system, and check that uh, check the satisfiable look check the satisfiability of that constraint and get a model for that. Answer is again a minimal model. Um, if we set C to false, then the problem is solved. Okay, fine. Um, so once we are here, what we can do as well is instead of popping here already, we could uh, check for assertions that satisfy maybe other branches that come in there. So we can build like a constraint system for satisfying a specific path through a program. And if that path is satisfiable, then we exactly know what parts of the program are reachable, which parts are not reachable, and we can generate these test cases automatically. Um, well, what you also see here is this goes very quick. No, you don't see that it goes very quick, but the answer comes out of Z3 within milliseconds. But this is mainly because of the types we are using here. If this would be full integers and this constraint here would be a bit more complicated, like um, checking, I don't know, multiple integers being of certain numbers or something like that, of course, it's the, the, the time to solve this would be more complex. If we, for example, check for string constants to hold specific values or something like that, um, again, the time to solve this would be much longer. And, and we build up a problem of um, um, state space exploration that is directly related to the size of these, um, of these variables that we're doing, uh, that we're treating as symbolic values here. Um, now, how does this relate to this thing about very fast before? Well, you have your program. You have here down here a window that basically tells you what the state of the heap is, what the state of the symbolic heap of that program is. You have down here a window that tells you what assumptions currently hold for the assignment of all the variables of the program. Um, you have down here, you see a bit of indentation here. So um, this is basically the different steps that you go through the program in, in a way of, you know, um, one function call, another function call, an assignment, an if statement, and so forth. Um, and what you see up here are these pre and post conditions that are assigned to the specific functions you call here. And you can see these pre and post conditions as assertions. So one of these assertions, for example, says that the memcopy function needs as input a destination array and a source array and probably the size argument. Um, if one of these assertions is not satisfied, as in one of the um, arrays will be null or something like that, you get an error because then this precondition here is not, satisfiable, not, not satisfied anymore. So by defining those pre and post conditions, you implicitly add branches to your program. And of course, you can check if these branches are re reachable or not reachable by the method I just presented on the last couple of slides. And if you then get one of these violations, you can look at what's written here and what's written here in this error message to find out what would be a appropriate um, assignment for the inputs of the specific function to actually cause the error in the real system. And you can replay that. You can use that as an input for a test case and actually see that there is a vulnerability, that there's a buffer overflow that can be potentially abused and that needs to be fixed before you ship that kind of software. Now, well, that looks pretty nice. The thing is, it's still kind of difficult. Um, you have to come up with these annotations that define precisely what the pre and post conditions of your APIs are, for example. And there is, there is a paper from, I think, two years ago from Bart Jacobs and uh, Hayes van Spaun that does so for the API of a um, of the Polar SSL library, as far as I know, and it's well. So it depends on the level of reasoning what, that you want to do. But if you want to specify these APIs at a general level that allows you to basically verify any kind of client code against such a library, 
you're typically into trouble and you have to spend some serious effort in getting that done. Um, but however, the, the interesting thing is that what you specify there and the verification results you get say something about all execution paths of the program. You're not talking about a single test case anymore, but you're talking about all execution paths that program may ever take. There is no missing of a test case that might lead to an error or something like that. Um, you, you could see it, I, I try to put it like this, you could see it as um, a very skilled and very diligent tester writing these assert statements explicitly in front of every function call, in front, um, maybe even after every function call, and then trying very diligently and without missing a single bit flip or whatever, trying diligently to um, make each of these assertions fail individually. That's what we're doing here. And that's the kind of guarantee you get in the end. There is, for all execution paths of the program, no way to make these assertions fail if you go through this process and get a green bar in the very end. Um, so the interesting thing here is, of course, that very fast does that automatically, all these trying to make assertions fail and, and coming up with potential test cases and potential um, cases for um, overflow conditions, for um, undefined behavior, things like that. And also, very fast supports concurrency. So if you have a program with synchronization points, barrier synchronization whatsoever, that runs in a complicated scenario on a, pro, on a, on a machine with, I don't know, 16 cores, and, and you want to spot that odd issue where like these 15 threads have to be scheduled in a very specific way to either maybe open a vulnerability or to uh, make the system fail, very fast can find this issue. I think your tester can never find that issue because your tester will not be able to even um, force the scheduler into that specific way of scheduling those 15 processes. That's extremely, extremely hard. Um, so that's kind of the strength of these kind of methods and that's what you need them for um, if you want to design systems that are really secure, that are really hardened against um, failures or even against attacks. Um, how good is all that in general? So one, one question would be, could we have found Heartbleed with just pure testing or would we need something else? Well, to be honest, fairly easy, right? So if you think about Heartbleed, then all it takes is one assertion before the mem copy that makes sure that the uh, target buffer is at least as large as that number that you get together with the, in, in, in the payload information and maybe one test case to make that assertion fail and you would see, okay, well, there is actually a problem there. Um, then the next question, of course, is why didn't we find it earlier? Why didn't anyone do it? Um, well, and the answer is simple. It's a bug. No one thought about this one function to potentially have such a disastrous uh, failure somewhere in there. And um, of course, we could have found it with testing. Of course, we have found it with formal methods, but we have found it with formal methods after we knew that there was a bug. And it's actually, well, if you think of it, if you know that a specific file has a bug within, you know, line 50 and line 100, if you put a diligent person on it and test it individually, you, you'll find it. And the same holds for formal methods. If you know that it's there, you'll, of course, find it. But, yeah? Uh-huh. Ah, I'll come to that. Yeah, 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 good question. Um, so I, I can't tell you for the SSL library. Really, I have no idea. Um, we have done case studies um, where we have explored, for example, code that runs on industrial routers, and we have found serious bugs in, the, in, in this code. And um, we have done this for an implementation of the Belgian ID cards that probably all of you have in your pockets and the nice white things with, the, with, the, with your name and everything on it. Um, and also there we have found synchronization issues, as far as I know. Um, how long does it take? Hmm. So we have different measurements there. If you put a not so experienced person on this specific tool with a specific task, I think he'll do like three lines of code per hour or something like that in terms of verification effort. Um, but that changes a lot with the complexity of the code, with the experience of your verification engineer. In the same sense as um, testing productivity changes a lot with the experience of your testers, right? The, I mean, testing is expensive, formal verification is expensive, 
which one of the two is more or less expensive, I really cannot tell you. It depends a lot on your, on your goals, on what you want to verify, and for which scenarios your software has to work reliably, and that really depends on your, on your code. For example, when you think of these concurrency issues that I mentioned before, and for example, in the, in the embedded routing code, we have found lots of synchronization issues. Um, it's really hard to test them. It's almost impossible to force a, a, a modern operating system scheduler to schedule your processes in a specific way. So if you want to find them, if there's real need to make this piece of software hard against potential attacks or potential failures due to schedulability and scheduling issues, you have to use that kind of method. I don't see another way at the moment. Um, so yes, with very fast, we have found a lot of bugs that um, were not known before, but the thing is, if a bug gets found and fixed before the software is deployed, then of course you never hear about it. Um, it's very different with like the heartbeat thing that got deployed, um, that caused data leakage here and there, and where a lot of people got awareness of the existence of these bugs. And then it makes it easy kind of to, in the retrospective, um, put it into a testing tool, put it into a verification tool, and see if we could potentially have found it. Yes, we do. Um, okay. So, very fast specifically, how good is that in this case? Um, we find this bug without defining a specific test case. I think that's the most important thing here. So you don't need to test it to think about a specific way of exploiting the software. You just take the idea of having this automatic tool that does the job for you and that tries to automatically infer ways of breaking your code or making your assertions fail. I think that that's a very important thing. Um, the, the other thing is, this is static verification. We do this at the level of source code without modifying the actual source code. We put annotations in there, but they have no meaning at runtime. They are not compiled into anything. They are just used for the verification tool. So with this kind of technology, you can explore the system behavior exhaustively and make really strong guarantees about this behavior, but you don't change the runtime behavior. You don't change the performance. You don't change the, the size of your, of, your, of your shipped code, anything like that. I think that that's a very strong thing here. Um, I will talk about a couple of other techniques that are similar, that may be a bit more lightweight, but that do rely on changing the actual code and give you maybe similar guarantees, maybe weaker guarantees. We'll talk about that later. Um, that means I don't have that much time, actually. Um, and another thing is writing annotations is certainly not easy. I've mentioned that before. Um, some people at Distrinet did it for a cryptographic library and it's really hard to come up with these annotations, for example, for cryptographic libraries that are reusable so that you can verify any arbitrary client code against that library. That's really difficult. Um, however, so this is about the piece of software that you're investigating. That's not all, of course. So just because you have proven a piece of software correct doesn't mean that it will never misbehave in the real world. That's the same for testing. So if you think of layer below attacks, you're doing your verification at the level of abstraction of the source code. And well, there could be a malicious operating system interfering with your task in a specific way, maybe even modif uh, modifying your task. There could be uh, malicious buggy libraries that just don't behave according to the specification that you've used in your verification. Lots of things that could go wrong. Buggy operating systems, uh, kernel level malware that interfere with your process. So even if you rely on formal verification to make sure that your software is correct and behaves according to spec, you still have to make sure that the assumptions you have at that time, namely, for example, that your software runs kind of in isolation, cannot interfere with by weird scheduling decisions or, or by um, attacks that may be directly writing to the memory of that process, um, be corrupted by, by these kind of attacks. So if you think of maybe Frank Pearson's talk in the morning today where he was talking about modern um, techniques for isolation and for security architectures. This is the kind of stuff you would have to do on top of that just to make sure that the assumptions you have during verification are actually preserved at runtime. And that's important. Otherwise, the guarantees you get here might not be worth it. Or maybe you're on a system where your verified piece of software is the only piece of software that ever runs. And there's no way of overwriting that or of deploying new software, like think of 
embedded microcontrollers or, or something like that, then maybe you can stop here and you're fine. There are many scenarios, many, many variables you have to consider before um, choosing for an expensive um, verification effort like this one, for example. Um, okay, let's stop here, let's look into other things. CLI, CLI comes from the Stanford University and is a symbolic virtual machine that runs on top of LLVM and allows you to um, symbolically execute parts of programs. So that means you define something I would call a symbolic test case that only covers part of your input variables, not all of them. And well, let's just look at one of these test cases. So that's a test case here. And in CLI, we would say that we make, let's say, the variable A symbolic. Not all the others, just A. And then we kind of invoke foo with maybe A and B and C may be symbolic or may not be symbolic. Um, you see from the arguments here, what you do is essentially you give a pointer to that specific input variable and you say how big it is and that's just a name that you use internally to later refer to that variable. And what CLI then does is essentially um, generate permutations of that memory space to test the program. And you can reuse these as test cases later on if you want to do so. And the nice thing is you don't have to do this for all variables in your program. You can just pick specific ones that you think might cause, um, are likely to cause errors in, in your program flow. Um, of course, that means your symbolic execution is kind of bounded. So you say precisely which variables you want to symbolically keep in your program flow. You say how much you want to permutate them. You can say, well, well, we have some restrictions here maybe on CPU consumption. We only want to run this for 15 minutes for each function or something like that. And that gives you a different, um, a different level of guarantees. The interesting thing, however, is this goes without annotations. So you don't have to do this whole annotation effort that I've been presenting for very fast. You just write these test cases and say, well, it's kind of similar to fuzzing or to random testing where you can say that you want to randomize certain inputs. Just again, we are aiming to exhaustively explore the state space of the specific variable. And there is support for um, symbolic arguments to programs, even for files and streams. And of course, if you think of a file and a stream, you certainly want to bound them. You want to say we want to, let's say, explore stream sizes of less than one megabyte or something like that, because otherwise your exploration approach will be completely unbounded and will never terminate. So, um, how this works is essentially by combining concrete executions and symbolic executions. That also means it's not a static approach in the sense that you shouldn't put any code in here that launches real missiles or clauses the, the, um, the, 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 the storm surge barriers at the scale, right? This will actually be executed. And this will be executed multiple times depending on what you define here. Um, and of course, it reports bugs if you have memory violations, if you have, I don't know, divisions by zero, if you violate certain assertions that you put into your code that will all be um, reported. And what you normally get if you use a lot of these symbolic variables is really high test coverage, like branch coverage around 100%, 90% to 100%, which is far beyond what you normally get in industrial uh, software development projects. That's one tool. Another one is by Microsoft, PEX. Has anyone used PEX before? It's .NET. I think it's pretty well known, pretty cool. No? <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. PEX does similar things, but with another goal. Here the goal is clearly to maximize test coverage. That is, you um, stick your program in there and it will run like a shadow copy of the program in a symbolic context and build up path constraints so that you can then in the next execution um, switch to another, to another execution path. Essentially you build up like a database of paths that you have explored already and you try to negate constraints on your, on your branch statements so that you can explore uh, new branches that you haven't seen before 
and that by, and by means of that very quickly generate test suits that can be replayed on your program without running packs and that kind of maximize path coverage or condition coverage, whatever you configure, things like that. Um, in that case, however, it's important that your code has branches. If there are no branches, if you kind of test a client to a library in isolation, that there are no assert statements, there are no branches like in the, in the heartbeat example, for example, then you will never explore the actual design space of that program because you typically don't dive into the libraries, but you do that at the level of the application that you're testing. Again, this is a combination of concrete and symbolic uh, execution, so don't launch real missiles. Okay, there are other tools that I don't want to explain in detail, but maybe some of them are really interesting for you. Facebook is playing a lot with these kind of techniques in a tool called Infer. Infer is used for their um, applications like the, the Facebook app that we have on our mobiles. It is also used by Uber, as far as I know, and, and a couple of other vendors of larger um, apps for Android and, and Apple. And it's based on similar techniques as very fast in the sense that it tries to infer and learn something about how the heap, the, the, the dynamic memory allocation of a program evolve and, and keep that as a symbolic state to find bugs. Everyone can use it, it's open source. Um, it might be worth playing around with this if, you, if you're using uh, Java or C, C++ code and need a tool that is more or less automatic. The people of Facebook have spent a lot of time in making this tool um, kind of user-friendly in the way that you can run it overnight on your code and you don't get thousands of potential spurious and useless error messages, but you focus on vulnerabilities that can probably be, um, that can be pinned down to a specific line of code and can then probably hopefully be fixed um, quickly. Another one focusing on embedded software is CBMC. It's a bit older already um, by Daniel Kroening and his team which is a bounded model checker that builds up the space, state space of a program and explores it to, let's say, a certain depth or to a certain width of um, 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 conditional exploration. Setups is a different thing that uses a kind of abstraction to uh, reason about Boolean program. That is, we transform a program that uses like strings and all these big variables and types into little bool type decisions and reason about that. There's a lot of documentation about how these techniques work and where they work best and things like that. So if you're more in the domain, embedded domain, then maybe this is what you want to look into uh, to get certain guarantees for your code. If you're more in the uh, mobile app space, then maybe that is more interesting for you. Um, just, just to give you some hints about ideas. Um, we are almost at the end of this talk. I tried to not draw like fixed conclusions, but ask a couple of questions or, or put a couple of questions here that I hope that are to some extent answered. So one is, what is formal verification? Well, it's means of reasoning about your programs or about the tools that you use to assess your programs by means of mathematical methods. And you get rigorous guarantees about the behavior of these programs out of what you're doing with them. In difference to that, testing is more empirical. So you're trying to explore program behavior, but you're not aiming to be exhaustive. You don't really know what you're looking for. You just try to find enough evidence for it not crashing for use cases that you can imagine, basically. Um, there are a lot of formal tools and maybe semi-formal tools that, aim, that don't aim for full exhaustiveness, but that go in that direction and you know exactly what you have executed, what you have tested. Um, that can help you to improve testing, that can generate test cases for you, that can analyze your source code, find vulnerabilities. And I've been trying to show you a couple of examples of these, uh, some of which, well, we've personal experience with some others that might be interesting for you. Um, is formal verification orthogonal to testing, or do we need both? Uh, that's kind of the thing I started with. I think we certainly need both. And it's very important that even if you apply formal methods to, let's say, a small security piece of um, security critical piece of software somewhere in your application stack, that you do proper integration testing and make sure that it actually works in the actual use cases that you want to um, cover in the end. How do they interact? Well, it depends a lot on the formal method that you're using. So if you do the full stack and start with developing your project based on formal specifications, 
then you should be able to use these formal specifications to generate your test cases. That's a pretty cool interaction point. Um, if you don't do that, if you like develop based on more natural language specifications and then end up with implementation artifacts code that you have to test and evaluate in some level of thoroughness, then again, you can use formal approaches like symbolic execution, like very fast, to explore more program behavior that is interesting. So there are multiple interaction points here. All of them are exciting and gives you sometimes very strong guarantees about the behavior of your software, but what you actually do depends a lot on well, your development life cycle, on the software you're developing, on your budget, of course. There are many considerations that I have no like general answers for. Um, can one of them ever replace the other one? Probably not, but maybe if you think of unit testing, uh, maybe then formal verification in the style of very fast is a pretty good approach to get a ground truth for your programs. And finally, that was, Initially a very long list, I cut it down to like four interesting references. So um, two papers about, this one is about the storm search barriers and how they were developed. This one is about formal methods, how they were deployed in like um, the Mondex protocol and things like that to find severe errors. This is more what, we, what I would talk about as approaches to verify at the specification level um, and then prove that your implementation somehow agrees with what you have specified initially. Then there is a paper by our group on um, industrial case studies with very fast, might be very interesting for you. And there is a very exciting paper on different approaches to use symbolic execution, specifically in the testing context, which contains a couple of tools that I haven't mentioned here um, that are specific to certain domains. Again, it depends a lot on what you want to do, what your objectives are, if this stuff is interesting for you. And that kind of concludes my talk. I will put the slides online. The references come uh, towards the end and you'll find all the actual uh, links to papers that you want to have there. That's it, questions? Yeah. So replacing testing by formal verification, but in general it seems like formal verification is works on a much more technical level than, than functional. I mean, it seems that we're testing, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm just trying to search it and just thinking out loud. But yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so in general, we're testing, you also want to cover very functional requirements, right? So mm -hmm. you have to mm -hmm. think, okay, what exactly do I want? And it seems with formal verification, <coughs> you might miss that point a little No, that's not true. No, um, it holds for, for example, these CLI and PEX-like techniques that really aim at exploring program behavior just to find bugs. If you use, for example, the very fast approach, you can specify functional properties of your program in terms of these pre and post conditions and verify that your function actually implements the right algorithm. Mm -hmm. I, I, it wasn't completely clear which one do you have to fill in and which one. <laughs> you, you don't fill in these boxes. No, that was what I thought. But where, which part do you actually do you have to? I mean, you have to define some stuff. Where is my screenshot? There. You fill in this part, yeah, okay. which basically says, in, in yeah, you could say, which basically says in a different way of phrasing it, what this function is supposed to do, or what it needs to satisfy its implementation. And then this here is just what comes out of running the tool. So it builds up a symbolic heap, a symbolic heap representation. It builds up certain assumptions over um, the variables you have in your program while it processes a path through your program. And for some C and Java. Also small talk. Um, yeah. Probably yes, yeah. But again, you have to make sure that you can isolate that code later on. If you have like 
function pointers going into that code and, and API calls that may modify the code or something like that, your guarantees are off. Yeah, I had a notion of this basic code to be dynamic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But the techniques are there, right? You have sandboxing, you have um, hardware-based techniques to isolate processes and things like that. Website. <laughs> what are websites good for? <laughs> Probably not. That's a difficult question. So my experience is mostly with low-level embedded code. Um, I could very well imagine that you have security critical parts in Java applets or something like that that you really want to verify. Yes. Yes. Yes and no. Um, where do I start? So tools like this one, for example, also allow you to make assumptions. Like you may assume that um, when you enter a function, a certain buffer always has, let's say, a specific size or is greater than something or is never null or something like that. Um, if you work with these assumptions, then of course you have to be sure. I mean, again, those assumptions may be wrong, right? So and at the level where these assumptions may be wrong, you get problems in your code in the end. Or you probably want to approximate like floating point operations in one way or another, which are not supported by this tool. So um, if you then, again, put assumptions into your annotations, into your code that say something about how these operations should behave or what inputs are expected, you may be off, of course, yeah. And, same for testing, exactly, yeah. So th there's no big difference here. Um, how difficult is it to write them? Well, um, uh, assuming that you have computer science degrees, you probably wrote loop invariance at some point in, yeah. So that's the level of difficulty we are talking about. You have to find a an, an, an mathematical way of expressing your program behavior in many cases, and that's often not trivial. Yeah. No. No, I don't think so. I think so too, yeah. <laughs> if you're looking for a vulnerability in, in unverified code, then you're probably better off just using fuzzing or random testing or something like that and deal with the results. Um, there are, of course, um, approaches that use symbolic executions to uh, directly derive inputs that can be used in attacks against a piece of software. People have done that against um, uh, libraries that play audio files and video files and stuff like that. So you can use these techniques to generate inputs that will drive the program into a specific path where you know that you can, you know, in some way abuse it. So there is a chance for abusing these techniques by attackers, yes. But I would say the chances for using random testing or symbolic execution to find a bug in a piece of code that has been formally verified before is close to zero. That's the discussion I had at the very beginning, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>